I'm ready. If you could, ma'am. Case number 138320, the people versus Robert Bashir. Appearance for the record. Good afternoon, Your Honor. John Boyce, fellow Ronald Ambrose here on behalf of Mr. Bashir. Okay, very good. The court has had an opportunity to uh, listen to the uh, testimony in this matter, and the court is going to make render the following uh, decision. On December 18, 2004, 14, following a jury trial, defendant Robert Bashir was convicted of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, solicitation of murder, first-degree premeditated murder, obstruction of justice, and witness intimidation. On January 15, 2015, the defendant was sentenced to life without parole after a very long and protracted trial with over, where over 80 witnesses were presented. On July 30, 2015, the defendant filed a motion for a new trial. In the defendant's motion for a new trial, he alleges six claims, all of which fall under ineffective assistance of counsel. The claims were failure to defense counsel to request a change of venue due to the high publicity of the case, faulty jury selection, and the de denial of the defendant's right to present a defense. Uh, basically, he indicated that the it was a failure of the investigators to properly uh, investigate and to assist the defense attorneys. The defense attorney's failure to file a motion regarding uh, the preservation of uh, Jane Bashir's clothing after she was taken to the morgue, and a violation of the defendant's Sixth Amendment right to confront his accuser, Joe Gintz. The co-conspirator who committed the murder, Joe Gintz's statements were introduced into trial, but he chose to assert the fifth, and it was appellate counsel's belief that this was done in error and that the defendant was denied the right to scrutinize the statements of Joe Gintz to the police. His out-of-court statements implicating the defendant were nothing more than a backdoor way of presenting such evidence to the jury without the scrutiny of cross-examination. And lastly, the court's example of reasonable doubt was inappropriate. Uh, also, the fact that this defendant wanted to take the stand and his attorneys advise against that. Uh, when the court has to determine whether or not there's ineffective assistance of counsel, the court has to look at two things. Was the attorney's performance so deficient? And if so, the deficient performance 
prejudice the defendant. In other words, there's a reasonable probability that but for counsel's error, the result of the proceeding would be different. An attorney is presumed to have valid strategy basis for anything that they've done. The defendant has the burden to establish both deficient performance and prejudice. Moreover, uh, according to MCL 770.1, the court can vacate a conviction and order a new trial for any cause or which by law a new trial may be granted or when it appears to the court that justice has not been served. 76.926 grants the court authority to vacate a conviction where it appears at the examination of the entire case it affirmatively appears that the errors complained of have resulted in a miscarriage of justice. A new trial also can be based upon the fact that there is newly discovered evidence and the defendant has the burden to establish factually ineffective assistance counsel and the basis of a new trial for the miscarriage of justice or newly discovered evidence. It is this court's finding that, and the court is going to sequentially uh, address each of these issues. It was a, this court's finding, and it was it's this court's belief, that it was Mr. Bashir's desire, with the aid of his attorney, Mr. Ambrose, to rewrite his ending, to challenge a process that afforded you a dream team of attorneys. You were provided two highly skilled attorneys, who combine lawyer years over 50, jury consultants, investigators who have been trained and had legal experience in both state and federal cases to undermine and cast doubt on the numerous days and hours spent preparing for your defense. You were afforded privileges that no other defendant has been provided in Wayne County in my 19 years tenure on the bench. Your appellate attorney drafted numerous bases to give you a second chance to do what you could not do in the first trial. That was to be found not guilty and to gain your freedom. Your challenges were numerous. You indicated, your lawyer, that the, the trial attorneys were deficient in not filing a change of venue. When the court had an opportunity to review the testimony that was presented, Mr. McCarthy said, I had no idea where the case could go, have gone, where it would not, where publicity would not have preceded him. He gained nationwide attention, and Mr. Bashir himself was on Dateline in February and again in May of 2012. There are television and newspapers everywhere. When asked about the change of venue, Ms. Diallo said he wanted to stay in front of Judge Von De Evans courtroom 802. He said many times he was getting a fair shake. He loved being here and how fair he was being treated. He was ha very happy except for the verdict. There was also an allegation as to the jury selection. The jury selection, they were uh, 150 jurors were broken up into three panels and they were given questionnaires. Ms. Diallo testified, we wanted a fair trial for Robert Bashir. We were provided a jury consultant who spent numerous of hours with us on the phone to find the right type of jury, juror psychologically that would be a good juror. Mr. McCarthy said that they were given the uh, jury questionnaires ahead of time and there was nothing inappropriate or unfair about those questions. When asked about the fairness of the jury, Mr. McCarthy, even in hindsight, I never had second thoughts about the fairness of the jury, none whatsoever. There was also a request, an allegation that the defense did not properly preserve the clothing of Ms. Fisher and file a Brady motion. Mr. McCarthy basically testified regarding the DNA on the clothes of any. She died two years ago before the trial what if somebody else's DNA was on her clothes? What if Bob's DNA was on her clothes? Too speculative. It was brought out by trial by asking officers why it wasn't preserved. 
we got as much mileage out of that as we could. Then there's an allegation that Mr. Bashira uh, wanted points to be made. Ms. Diallo indicated Mr. Bashir was a very active participant in his defense. He did what he wanted to do. We talked about every aspect and every element of the case. When asked about certain witnesses to be called Kevin Hall, Mr. McCarthy said he didn't know him. What about Wesley Johnson? Wesley Johnson was a man looking to do something for his own benefit. And if we had provided it to him, he would be very helpful to the defense. I believe he was willing to serve as a perjurer and wanted nothing to do with him. J.J. McCann, they could not find him. Then we go to the points to be made by Mr. Bashir. Ms. Diallo said, Mr. Bashir, who, and no offense, thinks he is the smartest man in the room, in the planet, thought he was going to tell me how to do something. As I explained to him before, I'm a lawyer. I didn't get this standing on the street corner. I got this by going to school. So with all due respect to Mr. Bashir, he cannot tell me or dictate to me which way he thinks something legally should go. His versions of the facts sometimes were a little different from reality of the case. And certain things I tried to point out to him absolutely came back to bite him in the behind. So yes, this man was defended. Unfortunately, the verdict was not the verdict he wanted. But I will not be pushed around by a man, and I wasn't going to be stark with Barbara Bashir. When asked about the issue with Chief Heller, Michael McCarthy testified, Mr. Bashir wanted him called as a witness because he believed he had a grudge against him. Ms. Diallo said, Ms. Diallo and I both thought it was too dangerous. It would open a can of worms. To do this with an allegation brought against Mr. Bashir a number of years ago regarding him molesting a child, one of his sister-in-laws, I also believed it would not help the defense in the least bit to discuss the allegations in front of jurors that had to decide if he was involved in a murder. There's also an allegation that Mr. Uh, McCarthy and the defense Ms. Diallo refused to go into Ms. Bashir's physical limitations. Mr. McCarthy, according to Mr. McCarthy, we had enough of this seedy, low-down, disgusting information regarding this lifestyle that was very salacious. I wasn't going to drag the good name of Jane Bashir into the mud during this trial by revealing irrelevant personal intimate details of her illness for three reasons. It was irrelevant and it belittled the good name of a person who was a victim and to embarrass her and to not mention the jury would have found it offensive. And legally, the HIPAA protections were in place for Mrs. Bashir's medical records. We decided strategically not to present any evidence about Mrs. Bashir's medical condition. Moreover, another allegation how was Mr. Bashir's story going to be told if the jury had not been informed as to why he was engaged in this type of behavior? The defendant's erectile dysfunction was told by, to the jury by a number of witnesses, Rachel Gillette and Therese Giffen. As to the lifestyle acceptance, Lois Valente was presented as a witness, and she basically testified that Jane Bashir said, you do whatever you want to do but I'm not going to be a part of that. It never crossed your mind it was a relevant piece of evidence that the jury found that the lifestyle choices were not due to Bob's erectile dysfunction and to leave out of Jane's medical condition. As Mr. McCarthy said, it, no, his erectile dysfunction was like he said in his affidavit because he was overweight and diabetic. It had nothing to do with Jane's medical condition. He also <clears throat> then there was testimony from two of the investigators, Joe Bruce, who testified that he was appointed back on January 23rd, 2014. He was a retired DPD. 
basically he indicated that he was brought on the case and the issue was that he wanted to read discovery, more discovery. Judge Kenny, the presiding judge, over this matter said you are to do what the lawyers tell you. And even according to Mr. Bruce, he told me to beat the streets and do what you do as a professional. And that's what I did. Ms. Diallo said that not all discovery in a case is like this voluminous. I would not have expected them to review all the discovery. It was untenable. He, she indicated he did everything I asked him to do. And even Mr. Bruce testified. I did an expert job with this case like every case. Despite not getting paid what I was requested, me and Mr. Gillespie did our usual 100%, 110%. Nothing was slacking there. We were asked to do it and it got done. Hank Gillespie testified that he had been a special agent for the FBI for 24 years and a private investigator for six. He indicated Despite us not being able to get paid and to do the skip traces, it didn't have any impact on the commitment that we made to provide expert services, <coughs> but certainly it narrowed the scope. He, ne he also indicated he never complained <coughs> to the court about the fact that he was unable to do the job. Then we get to Mr. Bashara's testimony. As captioned in the filing by his attorney, he says, the good, the bad, the truth, the false, the accurate, this misleading, misleading, the pure, the salation. It was Mr. Uh, Bashir's testimony, I did not hire, conspire, and I was not in the garage with Mr. Gintz at all. The defendant testified that there was no marital discourse. According to his testimony, after Jane was involved in a car accident, there was no more passionate kissing because her mouth was sore. We wanted to get the medical records to show that I was not having an affair. As we got older, the physical relationship dwindled. I was heavier than usual, and I got diabetes and high blood pressure. She was going through menopause, and the relationship diminished greatly. She was three and a half years older, and well, I'm a hot-blooded 40-plus-year-old man who, despite having erectile dysfunction, still had urges and could still have orgasms, and she gave me permission to go outside of the marriage. She said, look, do whatever you want to do to take care of yourself. Just don't embarrass me or the family. He further admitted that he took three women into his home, Rachel. Claudette and another woman into your marital bed and had intimate relationships with them twice. Your explanation was simple. The women were there from the women were there from out of town and despite all of your apartment buildings that you had, you took them into your marital bed for comfort. It was easy and convenient. Convenience trumped your wife's feelings. That was a question asked to you. Your response was yes lies about the lifestyle. You indicated that how you found out about the lifestyle was that there was a pop-up and that it intrigued you. But when cross-examined by uh, Ms. Lindsay, you indicated in your writings to Mr. Fascinelli that you had found a magazine when you were 13, when you were in elementary school and you bound your friend up and that's when you were introduced to the lifestyle. You also talked about Rachel Gillette. You wanted to save her after <clears throat> seeing her black and blue from an encounter. You even gave your deceitful little illicit affair a new title, a polymorphous relationship, the absolute basis of a master-slave relationship. It wasn't an affair because, according to you, you only brought her to your marital bed one time. It wasn't an affair despite the fact that you helped pay for her daughter's wedding gave her a family heirloom, and engaged in physical contact with her. Your testimony revealed your commitment to your needs only. You wanted your cake and eat it too. 
you were willing to expose very intimate details about your wife's personal situation to gain sympathy for your insatiable desires to feed your needs at the expense of others who loved you and you exploited, exploited them for your own selfish desires. The reason you gave for not letting Rachel go was, in your opinion, it's hard to find a good slave. You further testify that you put in place lies to protect your family, to keep your lifestyle private. What you didn't realize is that you can never separate the truth from lies. In the end, the truth will prevail. I didn't tell the police about Rachel because she was an innocent bystander of this tragedy. Well, what about Jane, a proverbial lamb led to slaughter because you wanted to get what you wanted? Her money and your freedom. You testified on many occasions that you were <clears throat> confused. You were confused when you asked Steve to bottle to kill Joe Gint. But you were not confused enough to pay him to pat him down for a wire when you talked to him. Not confused enough that when you asked him to, to perform this murder of Joe Gint in the Wayne County Jail, you would whisper because as you said, you don't want to be implicated in this. You even gave him a time frame. It had to be done in two weeks. But more importantly, you never, ever mentioned that you wanted him killed to avenge, avenge Jane's death. Instead, you said, why would I want my wife to be killed? She made $125,000 a year. I changed my mind toward the end of the day when you talked to Steve. But then you said, can you get it done? Your confusion was further revealed when you testified that there was no formal introduction of Jane with Joe. You testified that you first, your first encounter was when you and Joe were pruning in your lush backyard and that Jane brought out lemonade on the barbecue porch in October. But you told the media that only time Jen, Joe had come to your house was once in January. Your confusion was heightened when you testified that you weren't happy with the representation of your trial attorneys during the trial. Your memory was enhanced by a letter that you wrote to them. Ms. Lindsay gave it to you on October 30th. You wrote a letter to your attorney stating the following. I, we, want to continue as now believe that the truth, the pile of lies, is now present and coming to light. Fight, fight on, my legal warriors. And in another letter, you apologized to this Diallo when you said she worked for you. I now offer my sincere apology to you, and the good Lord knows how much I praise you and Michael McCarthy for all your, assist, all your assistance. I even told you on April 15th, 2014. If you're dissatisfied with Ms. Diallo and Mr. McCarthy, what are you going to do? Your answer was simple. Tell you. You never did. You then advanced a conspiracy theory in your mind that everyone was out to get you. The police. When Detective Locke and Detective Olson came to your house to inform you about Jane's death, they lied on you. I screamed. They killed my Jane and cried. They testified that you were calm. And your only concern was how the murder occurred. I fully and absolutely co cooperated with law enforcement. But because you were in a state of shock, you made decisions I should not have made. Like forgetting to tell them about your polymorphous relationship with Rachel. Then... Chief Heller of the Gross Point Police. According to your belief, the reason you were named as a person of interest in your wife's murder was based on the following grudge. Allegations of sexual molestation by you against your niece, niece were never prosecuted by them. Despite your testimony that while the girls, your wife and sister-in-law, were downstairs smoking pot and drinking. The kids were upstairs with you while you were naked and under the cover playing king of the hill with them. You supported Dean Valenti, your buddy against the person Hiller wanted. And the mayor had come to you five years ago and said, Bob, 
you're written to too many blacks and Albanians in our city and we don't like it. You further indicated that it was Lisa Lindsay's fault. That within the first week you testified, Miss Lindsay not only came in, she took over. I believe that Lisa Lindsay took over the investigation and controlled every aspect of it, including today, the people who are represented t today. I was forced to listen to Miss Lindsay and the prosecution hammer belittle me and blacken my eye about being a sadist. You even blamed her for throwing you in segregation and solitary confinement so you could not talk to your power of attorney, Rick Fasanelli. Also, let's talk about Dave Grimm's fault. I made statements at the behest of David Grimm. I did the interview with a dateline to give my story, side of the story because that's what David Grimm wanted me to do. You knew how to showcase your home and your awards, but you forgot to mention in that interview anything about Rachel and your polymorphous relationship partner and your BDSM lifestyle. You blamed the media. The media did everything in their power to feed the prosecution and law enforcement to disparage and to corrupt my case prior to me going to trial so that the jury would be have a preconceived notion of me through sorry fellas this media. You even blame me. I trusted you as well and your opinion in appointing these attorneys to me. I learned as the trial progressed that you weren't following through. They weren't doing anything. I should have fired them. But you never sent me a letter, complained to me about their representation until the verdict came back against you. You talked, you threw you said that the private investigators didn't do their job. They didn't follow through with the witnesses I wanted. They only followed the direction and lead of the attorneys. You even testified that had, and you blame politics on this. You testified and told Therese Giffen, I thought this was a political situation, and if I were black, I never would be treated this way. The trial attorneys, my attorneys, did, in my opinion, a good job. Like the comment Ms. Diallo made about you, Mr. Bashir thought he was the smartest person in the room. Well, I was the smartest person with all the knowledge of the different individuals. You further indicated that I absolutely listened in disgust that Ms. Diallo said that I wanted to stay in front of Judge Vonda Evans in her courtroom. The judge wouldn't do it. And so don't ask her. I wanted to believe, I wanted to leave because of the pollution and the poison in this region by law enforcement and through media. I wanted the truth to come out, good, bad, or indifferent. I wanted the truth to be told. When those lawyers told you, you said you seem befuddled. They said, we're not going to ask questions that we don't know the answers to. They wanted to be certain they knew what the <coughs> answers would be so they wouldn't hurt me. Two things I've learned in being a lawyer. You never ask questions of witnesses that you don't know the answer to, and you never put a witness on a stand that you don't know what he's going to say. And that's exactly what was done in this case with Joe Gantz. Your appellate attorney received information that from an investigator that there was indisputable proof of the innocence of your client. Finally, you had the information that you dreamed of that would either grant you a new trial or completely exonerate you and allow you to go free. We're talking about the affidavit of Joe Gantz. How fitting you thought you received a gift of freedom when in reality, Joe Gantz's affidavit as testimony would be the Trojan horse that would destroy your chance at freedom. He testified that the affidavit was, more, more, was lies, but he did say this. He said that the, the, he testified the defendant prior to the murder blew up my phone. I don't know how many times, but a bunch. Your phone records indicated that the day before the murder, you called him 20 times, and the day of the murder, you called him as early as 6.30 a.m. Your request to him you got to come over, and I need you 
to help me. But you have to be here by 6 o'clock. Your testimony was you were sweeping at one of your properties. And you had a drink and left the hard lounge at a minute to 6. Joe Gintz further testified that when he arrived, you let him in the side door of his garage. The door that's off the garage. There was a big issue about these keys. And as your testimony was, you came, you parked your car, you came in through the garage, and you went past the mudroom where you saw Jane's bag. You knew she was there. You knew she was a list woman, and you knew there was no list that was there, and you grabbed your keys. But what you forgot to put in this time frame is that what, this is what Joe testified. He indicated that he came over there. He knocked at the side door. You let him in. You told him, you said, you told him to be there at 6 o'clock. When he came in, he said you were arguing with Jane. And that you said, I'm going to go get her. Bob comes into the garage with Jane. Jane told Bob to get his shit out the garage. I want it out now. His signs, the rotary ones in the people's exhibit, his golf clubs, and to take them to Lockmore Country Club. I go to move the boxes, according to Mr. Gent. Next thing I know, he pulls a gun on me and he says, shut her up. Do it now. When he asked how many people were in the garage, he stated, there were only three of us in the garage, except for God, me, Bob, and Jane. He breaks her neck. And there's blood on the garage floor. While she's dead on the floor, the defendant goes over and pushes her breast back inside and says, Baby, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. He then went and got her purse and threw the contents, her wallet, credit cards, and cell phone on the passenger, front passenger side of the vehicle, which they then loaded her into the Mercedes Benz. When the court said, who is we? Me and Bob. He had the head of her. I had the feet. She was loaded in the, car, in the car in the garage. If you ever say anything, I'll kill you and you will be followed, which I was. Bob gets back into the Lincoln Navigator, the one that you parked outside the garage and then you went in to get your keys. The one... And then you left. And guess who you go to meet? Mr. Carmody for drinks. And you called and requested him to meet you around 7. Yes, there's a 30-minute time off. Joe took the body to dump it. And the clock said it was 7.30. Your promised reward to Joe for killing your wife was $8,000, a ring, and a Cadillac. Your attorneys advised against you telling your story your way. You attempted to have Joe killed while he was in the Wayne County Jail. You claimed that it was done to avenge the death that he had caused to your Jane. The only problem is, is that none of this was supported by evidence except for your vivid imagination. It was your hope that you could paint a picture of carefully selected words to portray a man who was so in love with his Jane that he arranged for her killer to be silenced forever. There was only one problem, that there was no evidence except your vivid imagination. Instead, the evidence portrayed a man who thought he was smart and calculating that he could have someone murdered in the Wayne County Jail. Your only purpose was to prevent this idiot, as you referred to him, from revealing the truth that you had hired him to kill your wife. You planned, groomed, and masterminded this pitiful plot to murder your wife and dump her body in Detroit like garbage, with a staged crime scene in one of the poorest areas of Detroit, hoping locals who, who would steal the car and contaminate the crime scene you would finally be able to be free to live your new life in the seedy, manipulative lifestyle you dreamed of, financed 
exclusively by Jane's money. But what you did not realize is a person you called an idiot would reveal your manipulative plan to rid yourself of your Jane. His he cleverly signed an affidavit, which your attorney took the bait, accepted it, and believed that it would set you free. But you never dreamed that this idiot that you claimed would be the one to outmaneuver Master Bob. With that, the court finds that the, the defense has not carried its burden to find that the uh, attorneys uh, were deficient as well as the court is going to so find there is no newly discovered evidence here that would exonerate your client. Moreover, the court is going to find that there has not been a miscarriage of justice. All of your motions are denied. You have 42 days to appeal my decision. If you cannot afford one, I want to be appointed to you. Thank you, and that concludes this matter.